Hi, folks. I am delighted to be back tonight to uh, introduce you to uh, my latest book in a new cycle, cycle seven for me. This book is called Book of the Dactyl. It's my third journal in verse. And what is a dactyl? A dactyl is one and a, as in one and a two and a three and a four and a five and a six and one and a two and a three, four and a five and a six. I'll introduce you to it by writing a poem that was special fun for me. It, was, it, it appears right at the beginning of this book. In fact, the whole book was so much fun that it's double the length I planned. Most of my verse journals only have about 100 poems in them. This has 200. Nice big fat one. Uh, still doesn't cost very much. Just pennies on Amazon. Hope you buy it. You'll have a grand old time. It's stuffed with good reading. Well, anyway, I'm going to start with a fun poem that I wrote just after c going outside. Uh, maybe four o'clock in the morning. I, I do usually stay up all night. That's a favorite habit of mine because I like to write poetry then. And there were deer in the yard. That happens often here. It's a nice suburban place, uh, almost rural. And uh, it, the block where I live on uh, particularly has the added delightful and attractive feature that people have not put up fences. There may be one fence on the block somewhere. You can't see it from where I am. And uh, what this means is um, the deer feel... Uh, it, as if they're in a park. We all feel we're in a park. And that's what I wrote about today. Lending idyllic refreshment, a morning's quick paper retrieval, grants me a gentle surprise. Deer walk at ease in the dark. Medium close to my door, they're at peace. And the tranquil reprieval helps me relax in the green Eden. Chill breeze in the park. Rapid they pass. Not alarmed, just a shadow-like swift apparition. Here and then gone, they could seem fairy tale visions to be. Surely the lack of old border enclosures had meant a tradition. Wander and roam, feel at home, resting or traveling free. Blockage and walls are unwanted, away with all mental immurement. Those who divisions create, unity vision destroy. Fencing good neighbors won't make, merely fabricate fear. True allurement means you are welcome. The earth no one can own, so enjoy. Tolstoy, I'm referring here to the, the Russian novelist Tolstoy. The, the tallest story he ever wrote was War and Peace, but he also does short narratives too, like Strider. Tolstoy wrote Holstomir, meaning Strider. The steed who is speaking, Lately, from master, I hear, phrasing remarkably odd, crazy, in fact, like, my horse and my donkey, oh, fool, to be seeking phony possession and pride. We are owned only by God. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've been having a pretty good time uh, showing uh, what the uh, dactylic form can do for the spirit, the form which I am using throughout this book of 200 fun poems. The dactylic um, uh, couplet is written like this, just to review briefly. One and a two and a three, and a four and a five and a six, and one and a two and a three, four and a five and a six. Now, what I'm going to do today is begin with a, a book I just finished reading and, and how it inspired me. It's called What They Won't Teach You by Andre Heikel. Haykel, sorry, H-A-Y-K-A-L, Haykel. And he, uh, he wrote this when he was 19. Maybe he's had uh, a chance to turn 20 after completing it. I'm not sure because he only finished it a few weeks ago. It's an extremely interesting book. He, it shows how he became a major entrepreneur. <clears throat> And the secret to his entrepreneurial triumph is a set of maxims, of which my favorite is this. Be obsessed. I just love it. Find what you like and carry it far and fast. Go with it. So 
I wrote a poem on that theme some time ago, and it ties in so well, that's why I started with Andre Haeckel. Uh, I have two epigraphs, okay, also two more favorite quotes of mine, along with Be Obsessed. This is from Oscar Wilde. Um, before his death, shortly before his death, it is reported that as Oscar Wilde lay in a dreary hotel room in Paris, he is said to have murmured, either that wallpaper goes or I do. I just love it. This man knew what he wanted. And similarly, um, uh, another uh, helpful way to direct your will in, in a fashion that will pay off for you uh, uh, thoroughly and quickly is this quote from Plato. Courage is knowing what not to fear. I get those from Simon Seabag Montefiore's book, Titans of History. Very enjoyable. All right, with those maxims in mind, let's start the poem. What do you like? When you find it, have courage till death to defend it. Soon you'll be gone, tis a fact. Meanwhile, decide how to live. Strive till you die. Have you influence? Him, that's the way to extend it. Be who you are. Through your song, show what's within you to give. Trend is no friend, but don't call it a foe. When you're living your mission, you will love liberty tell. Those who have, have ears, let them hear. I am an ambulant scripture. A pilgrim, my paths are tradition. Meter you feel when I breathe. Daybreak, the spirit is clear. What is euphoria? Carrying well, and as well, being carried. Be in translation, reborn, pyrophore, bearer of flame, who the unmanifest prove in the vastitude, cannot be harried. Follow the banners who may. I have been summoned by name. Either that wallpaper goes, or else I do. No power is finer. Shaping my heart work supreme, sovereign dominion I wield. Underground rivers of Eden, I, dowsing, am crowned as diviner. Bandwagons came, and they went. Fearless, the reaper in field. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, for tonight's poem, I actually picked a quotation from the same source from which yesterday I derived the marvelous quotes by Oscar Wilde and Plato. Tonight's quote comes from Titans of History by Simon Sebag Montefiore. And the quotation is, I quote it, quote it right at the beginning of my own reply, Sappho created a huge body of work. That's immensely saddening because we only have about a pamphlet's worth of what she wrote. And listen, Sappho created a huge body of work. Should I be uh, in any way saddened by that as a, a, a continuator of the tradition of lyric writing? Here's my reply. Sappho, most ancient and famous of poets of feminine gender, vast in productive expanse, never in depth can be known, barely a pamphlet length, Opera omnia, fortune would tender, laden with pathos to me, most into nothingness thrown. L not more imperiled than lyrical poems, their future arrival into your hand and your soul, those that posterity come only by grace of the fate that their randomized form of survival, judging from Sappho, will take, must over flood stream have swum. I will attempt to attain from the hand of my angel a pass key. How such a gift to acquire? Trying what no one's yet done. Colloquy volume, form faithful, and scripture expansion. And lastly, charmed by the music I chant, lovers I hope to have won. Judeo-Christo-Islamic tradition I glorify, seeing beauty Quranic serene, height that my lines will approve, dialogue volumes I show in the forms of our wonderful being, 
melodies mentor attained humans beloved to move i couldn't bring myself though to stop quite there because after all sappho sappho is so good that even if very little remains it's good to spread it around and let other people share it i can't read ancient greek but here's a gorgeous version i found in russian done by vyacheslav ivanov a marvelous classicist and translator and poet a hundred years ago listen Blis luny prekrasnay tusknyeyut zvezdy pokrywały mi lucizarny kroyut stob ana adna vse zemlya svetila polnayu slavay and here's my uh, reply it was called krasavice to the beautiful lady Stars grow faint near splendor, the plenilunar. They, the radiant face with a cover shelter, letting only her to the earth be shining. Glory adorant. Here's my reply in, of course, the meter of my book of the dactyl, which we're using these days on cycle number six. Beauty is godly in strength to entrance the enraptured hold captive what is it like i have asked knowing wherever you're near people will note your attraction while sensing their lives getting better something supernal revealed may in our world time in here see how the stars are deferring as sappho herself may be doing focusing light of her eyes only on lady so rare when the divine comes among us let's then be the fainter enablers grateful the vision to frame serving the worth of the fair actually of course this is our seventh cycle and it is a kind of sabbatical for me i am doing all kinds of joyful things simply because i feel like doing them thank you Back with Book of the Dactyl. Today I have something really exciting. I call it, with a rather pretentious title, The Psychology and Ethics of Goethe. Uh, he's the uh, author of Faust, Germany's um, greatest poet. Uh, but he also wrote West East Divan, which I have translated, and which has all kinds of nice proverbial folk type wisdom. And this poem that I would like to start with is by him. I translated it, it's quite short, and it's about how to breathe. This is called breathing. We'll start with that, and then we'll have a conversation with it. Two graces of competing kinds, one in the feet of breathing finds. Pressured, breathe in, breathe out, refreshed. How well is life's strength intermeshed? So thank the Lord when you are stressed, and thank him when he grants you rest. So, you get and you give back. Now, in his autobiography, Poetry and Truth, Goethe wrote another passage that I relate to this, even though he didn't. I love to make the connection. In fact, I made that connection the central point of my book, Blake and Goethe. Let's listen then to this other passage from his autobiography, which ties in so neatly with breathing. We find ourselves in a condition which, if it seems to pull us down and to oppress us, nevertheless gives us an opportunity, even makes it a duty, to raise ourselves up and thereby to fulfill the intentions of the divinity, so that while on the one hand we are constrained to self, that's a verb he made up, uns zu verselbsten, to self means to uh, uh, assert yourself, affirm yourself. On the other, we may not neglect to unself, another new invention, uns zu entselbstigen, in regular pulses. Now, the what I loved, what really set me off is the phrase regular pulses, because that's like breathing. When you breathe in, you're selving, you're asserting the value, you're affirming the value of your life, which you want to keep going with, with inhaling on a regular basis. And then you, when you give back, you uh, do the opposite of self-affirming, self-asserting. You do What you do then is self-transcending, giving back, self-renouncing, self-overcoming, going beyond the self. So you, you help the self and then you go beyond it. That's a nice key to moral life. You need to be self 
asserting because you need to preserve your vitality. You have to affirm yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself means you love both of them. You, then you are filled with, with, with joy of being, and then it spreads outward, and you love everyone and everything you see. Now, here's my little poem, bit in my usual dactylic meter, suitable to this book. One and a two and a three, and a four and a five and a six, and one and a two and a three, four and a five and a six. Take the depiction of breathing, the in and the out, making grateful humans who breathe and in this find both their life and delight. Add the psychology, selving, unselving, affirming, transcending. Here is our ethical breath, raising our health to the height. First, biological physics of taking and giving. Around us, air we acquire, and the gift back to the world we return. Then, as we're aiding, asserting, affirming ourselves by inhaling, so, breathing out from the self, perfect transcendence we learn. Saadi, this is um, a poet writing uh, in Persian, the scholars have noted a similar teaching expounded, this is perhaps where Goethe got it. Deep inhalation, he said, pleasantly lengthens our days. Then, breathing out, a relaxing refreshment gives joy to the spirit. Double the graces he found. Heart, grant the both of them praise. Hello, I'm back with my Amazon collection, Book of the Dactyl. And today, I would like to use as my starting point my introductory quotation or motto or epigraph, the concluding words from what is certainly the greatest ode, that is, solemn poem on a serious topic, ever written in the English language. You've probably guessed already, it's the Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats. And these are the final words. Cold pastoral, He's looking at the landscape on the urn, and he's turning it around. It's basically a country scene with people going to a uh, sacrificial pro uh, um, procession. They are uh, uh, going to sacrifice uh, uh, probably a lamb. Uh, it's uh, to celebrate some festival in honor of the gods, and it's a, a very peaceful, rustic scene. So, cold pastoral, cold, because it's made of marble. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt... Remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayst, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all. Ye you know honor, and all you need to know. It's interesting, he's talking about the time when old age will waste, will lay waste the, the, uh, the uh, generation now living. And actually, this, uh, this extraordinary, tranquil, and beautiful, calming uh, therapeutic re resolution at the end uh, contrasts very dramatically with what Keats was going through at the time. First, he was uh, dying of tuberculosis, and he knew that's that was the nature of the disease because he had just nursed his a younger brother uh, with hospice care through the, that illness before his brother died. And not only that, but Keats was a student of medicine. He was becoming a doctor on both theoretical and practical grounds. He knew what tuberculosis was, in addition to which he was suffering from syphilis. And for the pains of that, he was taking as a medicine mercury, which uh, as we know nowadays also is a fatal threat with its poisoning. So death was coming at Keats from three different directions and he would die in that year, uh, his uh, tw 26th year. Uh, so uh, I don't know of any poem in the English language that has occasioned more comment, but I, I love to write um, uh, poems that deal uh, with controversial uh, subjects, uh, solemn topics, but also uh, provocative, and so I couldn't pass this opportunity up, and here then is my reply. Keats's imaginal urn taught the union of truth and of beauty, two-sided both, for the vase ashes or wine might contain. Some like their drink to be dry, British humor. The succulent fruity won't be much praised, 
connoisseurs view it with cultured disdain. I, I, it always strikes me as funny how much I love sweet wine and other people seem not to be able to tolerate it. And they go for something called dry wine. The invent, reason for inventing that has never been clear to me. Unified beauty and truth isn't popular now when disaster, madness of nations in crowds, nature calamities vile, fills up the media, even a champion lyrical master can't make it beautiful truth, even with Keatsian style. Yet I, the truth of my feeling, can turn straight away into beauty, rising to life every morn, death left behind, I rejoice. Making, we godlike may call, tis emotion's own myth, Heavy duty, service performing for mind, lending prophetical voice. Keats, though a martyr, tubercular, mercury cured, syphilitic, lived out my dream to become loved and accepted and sung. Ranging through space-time, religions acquiring for poems, O oh, critic, feelings I pray to convey, truths of the lyrical tongue. Hello. Today, back with my dactyl book, my theme is carpal tunnel syndrome. And why is that important? Well, in my life, it was hugely important at one point, a near crisis, you could call it. Uh, when I was uh, 58 years old, I suddenly got carpal tunnel, not in one, but in both wrists at the same time, in raging and howling pain. I felt pretty desperate, but I learned some two very important things, three important things. The first is usually no surgery, whatever is required. You cure yourself and you cure yourself, this is number two, by exercises and they're very easy. For example, here, um, our arm outstretched and palm down and then you pull in. Then arm outstretched and palm up and you pull in or you could do it this way. Still palm up and you pull in. Then you do it with the other arm. Arm outstretched and you pull down. And uh, then you reverse and palm up. Palm up and you pull in or turn it upside down. Palm up and you pull in. All you have to do is do those things relentlessly, about uh, 10 for each arm, or maybe it was 20, uh, every hour for five or six weeks. I think I did it in five. And it, you'll be cured. You can be helped by uh, um, uh, sound uh, effect, uh, sound vibration effect uh, at the um, hand, hand therapist. That can help. But the main thing is the exercises. And hot pads uh, also uh, will contribute. But those exercises, they are the cure, and they keep the surgeons away from you. I think it's really better to avoid getting your body cut up, if at all, uh, if, if that can ever possibly be done. So then, that's the cure. And the other part of the cure is, make sure that in future you get an ergonomic keyboard, and here it is. You see, what you have is it's split in half and it's divided by, you can see there at the bottom, a knob which allows you to adjust the height and the angle. It's basically a tent. You play it like an accordion, not like a keyboard. Okay? That's my lesson for today, uh, and I'm now going to put it forth to you in an instructional poem. Help, carpal tunnel, what cure for the stealthy marauding affliction? Subtitled. Lessons from the late Dr. Emil Pascarelli, expert in repetitive stress injuries. Help, carpal tunnel, what cure for the stealthy marauding affliction? Time, though, would prove there's no need here for a hellish despair. Surgery, rarely advisable, based on implausible fiction. Wrist operations for this? Foolish, their burden to bear. Ready, set, go for the stretchings. A month and a half, that will do it. Forward and backward the palm, turned while the arm is kept straight. Countings to ten every session. Keep steady, and soon you'll get through it. Time for the healing's not long. Work and be patient and wait. While the tunnel malfunctioning linked to computers, I'll tell you. Keyboards with flattened down shape, style of a laptop, are bad. 
wrists overworked, if you type on a keyboard that's flat, will compel you sharp shooting dart pains to feel, ailment disabling and sad. That is what Dr. Pascarelli, who was in the Smithsonian Magazine as the world's number, uh, the, the country's number one expert on RSI or res repetitive stress injuries, told me. The, you should not, there's no such thing, he said, as a safe laptop. Keyboard will need to be split, the two halves at one corner connected. There will a button be found guiding the height of your tent. Type all you want on your board ergonomic. You're always protected. Motions accordingly unlike. Smoothly the forearms are bent. Women have more of a carrying angle. Their arms when they're walking, angle will make when relaxed. Those of the men are more straight. Flatness of keyboard is harder on women. They'd surely be balking, yet it's the men who control keyboard production. Ill fate. I, as it happens, a rather big carrying angle possessing, nearer indeed to the size women more commonly show, couldn't survive without curving the keyboard. Oh, medical blessing, it is to you that for life, thanks, I forever will owe. I'm in the mood for some fun today, so turning as usual to our book of Ovidian dactylic hexameter distics, I ask myself, what's the fastest poem, four stanzas in length, my usual length, that I can write in this form? How fast can I do it? Here's the answer. Try the experiment. Let us begin with no more than emotion, floating along on the wind, wishing to note what it sees. Tone that is filling my lungs, making rapid my heart is a potion. Breaths lend the energy mind, drinks ere the ecstasy flees. Breathing I've recently written about. Shall we turn to the typing? Here we'll continue the dance vigor inhaled to the start. Fingers on keys are a-hopping whenever they write about hyping. I'm in the mood today for some fun. I want to see how fast I can write one of these Ovidian dactylic hexametric distics, okay? I'm going to write it in four stanzas. That's my usual length. I actually began this looking at the clock, and then I look at the clock when I'm done, and you'll see how that works. Try the experiment. Let us begin with no more than emotion, floating along on the wind, wishing to note what it sees. Tone that is filling my lungs, making rapid my heart, is a potion. Breaths lend the energy mind, drinks ere the ecstasy flees. Breathing I've recently written about, shall we turn to the typing? Here we'll continue the dance vigor inhaled tried to start. Fingers on keys are a-hopping, whatever they write about, hyping. Making me smile and the laugh, gladly expanding the heart. No, you won't ever believe, he said coyly, how much I'm enjoying. This composition awaked solely by wish to make clear how such a six-year-old's playfulness, throwing the leaf words and toying, just as I like with the lines, let you the God present hear. Rushing along, I am eager to look at the clock and discover what kind of tempo I've kept. Just how much time did it take for running strophes to form, which the impulse a gift-smitten lover moves to create? The reply, nearly 10 minutes, no fake. I could go to the county fair and I could set up a booth with a computer. I could do it at a modest fee. I might not get any uh, customers if I charged an immodest one. And just see how, uh, how much profit I'd make during the day. And in fact, that kind of speed writing so hyped me up that I'm ready to do another one for you. Lessons in wordcraft we garnered above from our speeded up writing. Each was but vaguely implied. Further scrutation is due. First comes the major adrenaline boost that the athlete delighting, comes and climactic alas, peaks, peaks when the racing is through. Grecian Olympics had featured a lyrical hymn competition, just like a track meet today. Singers poetic performed. Heightening tempo employed in our lyrical line composition adds to excitement a source, heart of the hearer. 
is warmed. Rivalries, friendship increase when you like what your mentor is doing. Dialogue, writing, design, strikingly bringing alive, ageless the comrades that died, whose achievement we newly construing, ever more deeply revere, hoping their soul to revive. Running and racing and writing and singing and psalming and sending messages headed beyond. Brighter horizon light grows. Let me devotedly give with the aid that the angels are lending all that may show you my love comrades that newly arose i'm back and ready to resume where i left off last time um in episode seven seven i was talking about what fun it was to do a poem as an athletic event now in this book uh, uh, book of the dactyl i'm using the dactylic hexameter a hex hexameter distich, that is, couplets. One and a two and a three and a four and a five and a six. And one and a two and a three, four and a five and a six. Okay? Um, how fast can you write a four stanza poem in, uh, in that meter? I found out I could do it in 10 minutes. And then I went on in my next lyric to show uh, how that led immediately to the ideas of poetry uh, as uh, intimately akin to racing and deep breathing and healthy running. Uh, and that turned out to be important because in the ancient Greek Olympics, there were uh, events not only uh, for um, racing and discus throwing, there were contests in poetic declamation. And so now, and I wrote a whole series of these poems designed to show all the different kinds of uh, pleasures there are from writing in this meter. And one of them is the pleasure of rhyming, uh, because rhyming is a, a kind of a guarantee of found objects. And my, that's a subset of my real deep theme, which is the found object. In the Surrealist movement, you had found objects. Uh, for example, Magritte, the surreal painter in Belgium, uh, would uh, paint a portrait. and But all you'd see was the bowler hat on top. The face would, would have an apple right in front of it. So what kind of thing does that do? It brings together the apple and the face from different uh, uh, contexts and it places them together and shakes up your mind. And what does it do? Well, it creates a little bit of crazy comedy, but at the same time, it lets you process tragedy in a playful way. When uh, Magritte was a boy, uh, his mother uh, jumped into the Thames River and committed suicide. And when he saw her body at the morgue, the uh, apron... Uh, uh, of her, the uh, 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 in front of her dress had been pulled up to um, hide her face. That was the first of the obscured visages in the life and art of Magritte. So I do that in 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 poetry whenever I have. Uh, incompatible things or illogical things, things that don't naturally fit together. And I try to see if I can make interesting and unusual connections and work up new neuron ganglions in my brain. So uh, when you have, anytime you have rhymes, you have a system of words that harmonize in different ways than uh, uh, concepts fit together to make sense in an ordinary prose sentence. So verse sentences with rhymes open up a whole realm of found objects. And that means a new realm of playfulness, such as Magritte used when he was turning tragedy into comedy. And that's what I'd like to, to exhibit to you today, uh, or talk about a little in my poem. Rivalry, pace of creation, alluring me now is the topic known as found object. The key opening id prison gates, making strange use of the quite unexpected, a mild psychotropic. Here clinged surrealist thought, Eden for dream writing waits. Things that were seemingly found may be placed by the artist together. So in Magritte will appear apple concealing the face. What is the value of that to provoke and the brain to untether? Loved one with visage well hid had in his childhood a place. Here is a perfect example. Irrational loss of connection, lack of a logical link, deepened the secret we feel. Freeing unconscious material leads in a helpful direction. Super is sur in the French. Dream life, the super surreal. Do speed up your rivalrous writing, oniric. New items combining, lines will arrive in your mind wilder than ever before. Rhyme may be likewise beheld as an object well found, realigning fear and desire 
tis a win window to open a door back with uh, the uh, book of the deck too and um, having lots of fun with my uh, lessons in wordcraft uh lessons in wordcraft part four let's have it and then we'll do number five they go nicely they wind up the set and they're paced to be just about right racing and rivals and rhyme and found objects can prove that we're playing that is the fourth of my themes huge the importance of this look at a third of our verses in realms of the games am i straying playfully pert and alert humor contributes to bliss schiller had claimed that in playing we learn what it is to be human not only dramas at play artists are players at heart Rhyming and rhythm and speed in a nightmare and a daymare illumine how we our lives may perform. Poet is playing a part. Ludic, we lightly allude. For our play is not saying, but singing. Mood will emotional truth musingly, momently show. Impulse we childlike indulge, and the whims we promote will be flinging, while for a sportive reward, glee will give scryer a glow. Restive in questing, we Everest never at rest will be climbing, seeking right now to lay bare all that the fates may allow, praising the God who with honey my lips had equipped for the rhyming. Meter let measure my days, Mercury teaching me how. Well, if you want to make sure that you have uh, a wonderful time, not only reading, but being read. My final poem is about how to avoid pet words. You avoid them by watching for them. Did you know you had pet words? Most people don't, everybody has them. Uh, so just watch, there are words that uh, you like without knowing it, but the reader knows it. The reader will get tired of it. So this is just a little helpful hint for getting even more fun out of writing in this marvelous Roman meter. Here is a little addendum I also would like to contribute. Trying for rapid or speed, dividends will you acquire. One of the best of them surely must come from the overview offered after you finish. You'll find do-nothing workers to fire. What do I mean? I'm referring to favorite words that are sneaky. These are your space crowding pets, things that you write when you're tired. Everyone has them. They help statisticians determine the author when an anonymous work's hidden ID is required. One of my earlier tomes had a book review lyric revealing two of the favorite words used by an author I'd read, fierce and pragmatic. They proved an embarrassing, empty distraction. Bored, I had wasted my time marking the culprits in red. I was just, just exasperated learning about a dozen different authors, that each of them was unique in being both fierce and pragmatic. Oh, how tiring, how tiring. Writing your lines in an upburst, a spurting, a sudden enjoyment. Soon you are done, but you know it. Foolish pet words that occur. Canceling these, you're rewarded for extra intensive employment. See the deletions? They mean demons you've learned to deter. I'm back again with my Book of the Dactyl. Tonight I want to explore in my uh, introductory comments and brief poem some of my activities as a treasure hunter. Basically, in the 15 and a half years of my retirement, let's say retoolment, I have become a treasure hunter in world mythologies, religions, and scriptures. Uh, for What do I look for? Precious gems. One of my favorite places to go looking happens to be the Quran, the holy scripture of Islam. And I went looking there some while back, and I came up with two treasures that I want to share with you tonight. Let me read them. First comes Quran 3022 talking about God or ultimate being. And of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the difference of your languages and colors. Lo, here indeed are portents for men of knowledge. You can learn from this. Portents is an, he uses the word in, uh, in the older sense of simply a sign, an omen or an emblem. 
And uh, what what are these signs? So far, he has uh, offered us four examples. Heavens, always in the plural. Earth, and the difference of your languages and colors. In other words, the fact that you have different languages. All the glories of your varied languages and all the beauties of your varied skin colors. I don't know of any other scripture that praises exactly these thing to these things together and emphasizes them with such glory and and strength of spirit. So those are four things: the heavens, the earth, the, our languages, and our skin colors. And now we turn to forty nine thirteen and listen to this: Oh mankind. We have created you male and female, and have created you nations and tribes, that ye may know one another. This is not like the Bible story of Tower of Babel, where the uh, the fall of the tower meant that languages would, were diversified and the world suffered from non-communication. That's not it at all. When languages are diversified, the world benefits by a, a potential for mutual understanding, and the same thing happens by uh, directly from the fact that we are of the gen different genders. So now to heaven, earth, languages, and skin colors, we we add genders and uh, ethnicities, tribes, nations, and groups. All of these help us understand each other and love one another. And here's my poem about that. Lovely the heavens and earth, as our colors and languages vary. Beauties will thus be revealed, changing and ranging in hue. Handsomeness humans relearn in the mountains, the forests, the prairie. Tropics and northerly chill, vivid the altering view. Perfect your colors of skin and of eyes and of hair. Let the tower, Babel its name, be reseen whence a great wonder arose. Difference here was revealed as the fount of all generous power. Genders and nations and tribes, knowing them well, how one grows. Languages, each is an orchestra, tones and inflections unending. Russian and German and French, Hebrew and Latin I've tried. New personality you will acquire, foreign music befriending. Miracle genius of tone, holy in each I've described. To descry is to perceive or behold or discover. Merit, expansion, concision alike will attain, and the varied metaphors hidden or bold, tender emotion and strong. Come to the mind when the words can a treasure preserve, never buried, stories they tell of the ways one to the world may belong. Heaven and earth will the leaven of word with a levity waken. Wisdom you'll get from the root, loosened the fertilized ground. Grateful becomes for the light and the air and the interest taken. Dig in the depth of our speech. Tell us the teaching you found. Hello, I'm back with more spelunking, that is, hunting for buried treasure. Speleology is the science of caves, and I go looking for treasure in scriptures and religions and mythologies, and I'm back with another major find in the Quran, and I would like to read you. Um, this is verse uh, 20, 75, and 6. Such are the high stations, gardens of Eden, Underneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever. That is the reward of him who groweth. What are we learning? We're learning that if you grow, you live in a garden of Eden, and under it is an underground river. Now, in the Bible, there were four uh, rivers that met in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were placed, but I never heard a word about their being underground. But it really helps to remember that uh, this scripture is written uh, to appeal to the hearing uh, and to affect the emotions, the heart, to speak to the heart of a desert dweller in Arabia. And if you will just think of yourself as ab abiding 
in a garden that has a river underneath it. You know that, particularly in as much as such underground rivers sometimes uprush as a fountain or a spring, you will never die in that situation so long as you keep growing and living in that garden. Simple as that. Now, what is this underground river? We all have it. You have it. I have it. it. You can call it by many names. I suggest the unconscious mind, or you can call it the grace of God, or some people prefer, I like this too, uh, the favor of the muse, the goddess that inspires poetry and the rest of the arts. I like to picture her touching my lips with honey while I'm in my cradle. An ancient Greek poet thought that up. It isn't original, but it comes back. Okay, here's my poem. Let me abide, holy strength, in the gardens with rivers beneath them. Blessed that refreshment impart, running abundant below. Waters not hoarded, but poured, should a towering fountain bequeath them. Treasure of depth become height, cherished as hourly I grow. I am a pilgrim and merchant and trader who spread out before you cultural wealth which I get wandering, journeying on. Nations and peoples and tribes and the spirits who kindred adore you. Each is a host and a guest even to the yondest of yon. I am a dialogue writer. The seekers I've met have transformed me. Shakespeare and Rilke and, yes, words of the wondrous Koran, each at the campfire had lit a great blaze of I am that had warmed me. Westward I travel in years, yet every morn do I dawn. Part of me goes on the road. Views uncovering, borders traversing, glad caravanserai halt, loving for stories to hear. Yet am I too in the garden enrooted with power conversing, being endowed with a gift. Listeners kindly hold dear. My inspiration tonight is coming from not uh, an ancient work such as I've been citing lately, but a relatively recent one, uh, The West East Divan uh, by uh, Goethe, Goethe, who is Germany's greatest poet. And uh, what I especially love about this, I love everything about it. I translated it uh, in uh, 2010, and I translated with the help of my friend and collaborator, the late Peter Anton von Arnim, the notes and essays explanatory of the work um, for the very first time that this has ever been done into English. So what do I find here that will be the buried? Remember, I'm a, a hunter for buried treasures and gems uh, in caves and under the ground, in religions, in mythologies, in scriptures. Here I find you're just saying something that I want to remember. Uh, because it's a spiritual guide for me. He says, what I would like best is to be regarded as a traveler who would uh, let his countrymen enjoy more readily whatever it is he brings back. The traveler taking on the role of a merchant who displays his goods appealingly and tries in many ways to make them pleasing. See, he goes on to explain that he wants to be like a merchant uh, traveler who stops at a caravanserai, which is uh, uh, located near an oasis and serves as a hostile, hostel, uh, a hostel for uh, uh, caravan travelers on camels. And they get together, uh, and at night before uh, uh, retiring and after a, a pleasant meal, they share their goods. They lay them out on tables and let people touch and handle and inspect them. And then they also tell the stories attaching to each of the cultural treasures they've acquired. I want to be that kind of a person. I try in my dactyl poem for tonight. Four are the products I offer on long caravanserai table. First are my musical arts, rhythm and melody rare, distant their origins, temporal, spatial, and each will enable songs to be written with tunes you are invited to share. 
Next is a genre, a new type of writing, a book conversation. Start with my rendering true, faithful to shape that I find. Then, facing page, a reply in the mode that, with childlike elation, I, having learned, will employ poets in friendship aligned. Third is my globaling drive, seeking out each religious tradition people have found bringing life, strengthened and daring and bold, Judeo-Christo-Islamic, or Hindu, or Norse, ebullition comes when a myth is a cup, water of spirit to hold. Fourth are my journaling nights, when my life and my lyrics together grow and develop and fly, sharing the being I breathe. Here you will see me respond to, or blend with, or conquer the weather. Nightly of beauty I learn. Mentors, their brows I enwreathe. As a hunter for buried treasure, I find there are very few places more fun to be digging in than the works of Shakespeare. You may remember this book that I published in time for Shakespeare's uh, 500th uh, anniversary uh, in, uh, fifth, let's see, that would have been um, 2116. He died in 1516. So uh, for that event, uh, I interviewed him. 154 times. He wrote 154 poems. We together wrote 308 and we published it as an interview or a talk show with him as the guest and me as the host. And we talked about his love life for a long time. And it's one of the more enterprising things I ever did. It's not timid because what I'm doing in that book is I'm asking you, will you please compare me and Shakespeare? Not once, not twice, not three or four or five times, but 154 times. Will you do us both that favor? That's what I really wanted to have happen. Anyway, I'm still having fun with Shakespeare, and he's the subject of tonight's poem. Uh, with Shakespeare, uh, you have some interesting documents, uh, including his last will and testament. And you know, the most puzzling thing he says there is that he leaves to his wife, and these are his words, the second best bed. In the last five centuries or so, people have been puzzling a good bit about that, and I had a lot of fun with it. Here we go. Shakespeare, when writing his will, made a query provoking provision. He would bequeath to his wife, ready, the second best bed. People have claimed that the guy may already have made that decision, leaving his wife and the kids. What did he have in his head? Planning to forge a career as a playwright in London, foregoing family life while the spouse had to get by on her own. Did he remember to send her a letter? We'll never be knowing. Sonnets of friends and of loves tell he was rarely alone. Surely Anne Hathaway felt if her husband would have to be leaving, lonely the nighttime would be, spent in the second best bed. Bed number one would no longer exist. I imagine her grieving. Yet, I'm not fond of lament. Let's have some humor instead. Maybe the object bequeathed, when it's found, will be proudly presented. People, consider this deal. How about spending the night here in a second best bed? As a guest, it can cheaply be rented. Midsummer dream of the bard, near to the heart of delight. Good morning. I have something quite special today. I'm going to use my ancient Roman meter, the dactylic distich, one and a two and a three, and a four and a five and a six and one and a Two and a three, four and a five and a six. You can do anything you want with this meter. And I'm going to try to prove that now because I'm going to apply it to a, a conversation between two uh, college students. They're using their iPhones. And of course, you'll hear just one speaker. Uh, I get to, you wonder if, if you're wondering what my source of info is, I overhear things like this when waiting for a bus sometimes. Okay? Here we go. Right. So it's kind of like, well, if you get what I'm saying, I mean, like, yeah, we just met, and she's like, what? And I'm 
kind of like, hey, look, I don't know what you're thinking, but one thing for sure I can tell you, I'm not the kind of a guy, look, I mean, what did you just say? Uh, I, I can't hear a word. Are you using that the phone that you dropped in the water? What? Don't be giving me that. No, I'm not being a nerd. Look, if you'd maybe like, no, Johnny Depp, no, I don't. I don't hate him. Just when I'm trying to, oh, crap. Don't you want to be heard? Geez, you've been wearing me out. Oh, all right. When's the chem test? I, I think I maybe could use, like, you know, what? Got a study group? Jeez. Didn't you say you would maybe, I mean, like on Monday or, or Tuesday? Got to catch up? No distract. Really? I mean, oh, please. Hello. Today, a really surprising and wonderful thing happened to me on my way to the video. I was trying to decide which of my dactyl poems I should uh, uh, recite for you and act out. Uh, and I was start startled and stopped by the view from the kitchen window. You see, there's a bush that grows right up close to the glass. And it means that when a squirrel or a bird perches on top of it, you get a giant size, extra big view. Uh, the the animal or the bird is just looking right into your eyes. And it's an extraordinary photograph, which I wanted to duplicate in words. So I went to my machine and here's what I wrote. And that's my going to be my dactyl poem for today. It's called, appropriately, Kitchen Window. Tree or a bush. With the branches elastic, where squirrels were feeding lately on buds, you have turned all of your leafage to red. Muted and muffled and soft is the comfort of russet hue, leading someone to visit today. Carmen and heartened he sped right to the top of the uppermost twig where the body he swaying seeming to favor the breeze liking the movement it brings looking me straight in the eyes keeps a bouncing as quietly playing all of the boughs are at once joining him blithe while he swings Cardinal eye over beak framing square of deep black, there's a mitre. High will the triangle rise, full and amusingly big, bobbing his head in ascent to November. The spirit feels lighter, watching the choreographed ensemble wing on the twig. Squirrels are happy below, I don't doubt it, both feeding and racing, swift is the passage of youth, glad and exultant as fall. Pierced with rapidity, I am enlivened, their leap life embracing. Still, tranquil cardinal bird, you must I love most of all. Maybe you'll notice now that I am wearing my American Real shirt. That is a tribute to my friend Roger Brooks, Mr. American Real, who just quite recently celebrated a birthday. My slightly belated tribute to him is called Song of a Shirt for Roger L. Brooks. All of my friends are aware of my story before my retirement which, if you'll let me intrude, isn't a word I admire. Rather, step back for the traction you'll need when you start running forward. Then a resilement you'll gain, happy, resilient soul. 
That's interesting, isn't it? I should explain that. I don't like the idea of retirement. It means to withdraw. I like resilement because that means to take a step backward for traction to get you started on a super fast sprint forward. Since then, since writing this poem, I actually have come upon an even better word, which is retoolment. Always better and better words. Good. I've resiled, so I'm ready. I know you're relieved for quick running here is the vow that i made poem per day will i write that was my plan and i love it it's made me immensely productive now just imagine what fun roger your project becomes after i purchase a webcam and straight away learn how to work it 21 days in a row each time one minute i'll speak swiftly applying the camera skill that friend michael has taught me that's all it takes to become part of American Reels Live Tribe, the Tribe 21. And the shirt that's proclaiming the message gives me an edge from the start. None of the words can be read till the whole thing is beheld. What a witty design in the mirror, ready for viewers to love. Tribal delight, let it be. I'll stand up and show you once again this marvelous shirt uh, that can be read um, for, by you uh, with great clarity because, and it's important to do that, this is my tribute to Roger, uh, just slightly belatedly, and may he have had a most splendid birthday. Well, November greetings. Some people think of November as the month of no, but I take the more positive attitude and focus on November. Actually, I like the whole first uh, two syllables, Novem. That's the Latin for nine. And this used to be the ninth month of the year. So if you still had four months to go before uh, uh, the year actually began, in the old days it began in March, then you'd have uh, fully uh, a third of the year still to live through. And that's quite a lot of vitality uh, remaining for you. Now, here's a poem from my dactyl book, of course. That's what we're doing in this cycle. And I wrote it last November. <clears throat> and here were my thoughts. Heftiest yet, the odd frost of our late come, uncommon November, clumped like a gray and white moss shaped on a background of green, centers of white in each clump for the snow, on the borders the ice gray, dotted with drops of the rain, both kinds of color are seen. Lawn being cut only yesterday made for a meadow-rich framing. Other lawns, verdure less fresh, yield more completely to drifts. Even the part of my yard by the rain less affected is whiter. Shape of the plants under snow, heavily pendulum shifts. These are the work the photographer loves for the texture invention. Magnified single square inch filling an art journal page. Leaves of the lilac unbrowned though with icing. The cordial intention love to maintain will show forth heart formed reluctant to age. We have plenty of ways of making November, you see, pleasant for ourselves. We relate the ice to icing on a cake, as I do here. And uh, uh, we can also bring in uh, other poems that have to deal with, uh, um, how should we say, down times or sorrowful times, uh, such as Walt Whitman's, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. He made me realize that the uh, heart, that the uh, shape, of the leaves of the lilac is that of a heart. Uh, although I have one in my front yard, I had never noticed that until I read, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. And the heart symbolism of the shape of those lilacs in the very first line is very important because that is um, Whitman's love song. It is his funeral elegy to Abraham Lincoln. My theme for today from my dactyl book as usual is the experience of being in the city of Rome in the Cathedral of St. Peter. Now, I uh, went there, and it is one of the more overpowering things I ever expect to see or to feel. So I was struck by the interest of this little two-liner that the poet Friedrich Schiller, Schiller is the second greatest poet perhaps in Germany, uh, next to Goethe, and he was Goethe's friend for a long time, um, 
it, it, he calls this poem at St. Peter's, and I'll translate it. If you, immensity seeking, have come, you have entered in error. Greatness for me is to make greater the seeker himself. Let's hear what he has to say about that. Breadth and the height of the heaven are dwarfing St. Peter's. The latter, only enormous, appeared next to a physical man. Depth of the spirit, eclipsing the putative hugeness of matter, shows, shows you not just what you've done, rather foretells what you can. Aha, so if you just think of the building, the hugeness of the stone, it can dwarf you, but if you think of the power of spirit needed to conceive it and construct it, you may feel exalted and expanded and bigger, not uh, 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 tinier than you were before. Huh. So, bigness of number, like largeness of size, may deflect and distract you. Tedious talk of the trend shrinking your energy source. Dizzying mirrors and devilish echoes in ambush attacked you. Penance, pathetic, succumbed, lasting and lashing, remorse. The power of the trend is um, as strong, if not stronger than, any, any power of a, of a church or temple because uh, largeness, peer pressure, peer pressure is what does it and can in, do you in and maybe you'll be done for as a result. So bigness of number and bigness of structures in stone can be a problem, but largeness of spirit is the way to counteract them. Abraham, asked by his father what happened to shatter the idols, pointed at once to the one biggest of all who survived. That guy, he smashed him. Such wit, no enslaving authority, bridles. Think you can rival the gods? Christ, then your reign has arrived. My poem for tonight is a little story about something that happened to me at almost exactly this time last year. I had gone for a couple of hours to rehearse with the Binghamton downtown singers uh, for a performance of Handel's The Messiah, his great oratorio that's performed every year. And I came back in a wonderful mood, but too, quite exhausted. And I uh, was falling asleep just almost completely when I heard verses coming to me in the amphibrachic rhythm, la la la, and then in the anapestic rhythm, la la la. But I, I just dismissed them because I, I was putting together this book of the dactyl, la la la. But then when I woke up, I thought, oh, that was such a nice sensation. I wish I had captured those verses. It's not as if because I've got a new meter that I'm working on, the other ones have somehow become obsolete. They're all always available. So I tried to recreate um, what the first verses that I had got were, what they were like, and I, I, I tried to bring them back and weave them into a story about the whole event. And that's my poem for tonight. Advanced in my project, I want to revisit the Amphibrach past and the Anapest too. You rise from the depth and you call me. So is it not right I saluting and welcoming you? Fiery horse of the night, you advance in your force, widened nostril a snort in unswervable course, who are calling. Don't ever forget me, I pray. Just a word of reply, let me ask for today. Falling asleep after evening Messiah rehearsal, I heard them amphibrach lines that in strength sang and in clarity grew. Oh, but I wearied, so wanted to sleep, while to rise and rebird them, further they urged, and the wind howled, getting loud as they flew. Yet I admit with regret I had let them pass by, disappearing. Now they will never return, were but the lesson well learned. Words coming down to the air of the heaven, O oh, bounty endearing, better reception than this you had assuredly earned. 
Me out of many you picked to receive your Olympian chanting, and for Brack Anapest both granting to me as a gift. Now that Ovidian dactyls I pen, I should never be scanting earlier dower of skill, power, the spirit to lift. Coleridge had claimed that a merchant from Porlock, his verbiage boring long had outpoured, who had erst knocked, so the poet awoke, reft of the Xanadu dream. I, your angel forgiveness imploring, cry, oh, your burthen is light. Easy the weight of the yoke. You notice what I did? I sneaked in a memory there to give the whole thing a little unity, uh, uh, a memory of the Handel Messiah uh, one, uh, pieces that we'd been practicing, in particularly this one. His yoke is easy, his burden is light, his burden, his burden is light. Episode 19 in Cycle 7, I'd like to offer a poem with an interesting theme. I've dealt with it more than once because I notice I have a little epigraph uh, uh, to this poem coming from my book of the Amphibrac, Amphibrac uh, La La La, and this is the book of the Dactyl, La La La, and here I want to st uh, study the theme again because it fascinates me. The theme is being grateful for your nightmare. And I've had to think this through because I have a lot of them. I taught for 35 years, and even though I've been retooled for the last 15, I'm still getting nightmares of uh, writing an exam in a course I never took or uh, giving an exam in a course I never taught, that kind of thing. Dereliction, dereliction of duty is the pervading concern. However, the, the plus part of it is that when I wake in the morning, it can actually take me several minutes to persuade myself fully into belief that that was not reality. What I have now is vera is reality. Uh, uh, a lot of times that is augmented if there are birds outside. And uh, I have uh, a bird in this poem which, uh, which sings do re mi. I spell it do re as in the French word for golden, me, because it has such a golden... Uh, uh, um, resonance and vibrancy of reality. And, uh, uh, well, and that makes me think of the French engraver Gustave Doré, who illustrated everything from the Bible to Paradise Lost to Rhyme of the Ancient Manor, and he makes me aware of alternative worlds to be in. So those are two things. And then, I, in order to honor my dreams, bad as they often are, uh, I, I call my dream a sweden. That's because it rhymes with heaven. And it's so beautiful to say, and it's an older word for dream that I have decided to bring back into the modern language. There are no tariffs I can import from any century I like. Uh, so, um, and why do I want to do that? I want a positive word for dream because I'm grateful for these nightmares. I think that they are movies in which mental forces act out their problems. And then when I wake up in the morning, though it can take me a, little, a minute to get over it, uh, I'm done with that for the day. Here's my poem. My lyric proclivity, melody-headed, bespeaks a fictivity, suavenly bedded. The body that wants to be heard, you will see, as golden emboldened in birds de re -mi. Happy, restored by a nightmare, I wake, seeing rays through the curtain, favored by angel that heals. I, word of weight, taking in, loved in my sleep, keen perception arriving, and speech turning certain, daylight emboldened can feel time to beget, so begin. Effort exerted and battle endured by the sweven, the dreaming, we are prepared for the morn. Golden the birds do re me, Gallic do re comes to mind, who an aureate vision beseeming, sacred engravings had made, spirit for soaring to free. Sugar? 108, a remarkable number. I'm riant. Calories gone by a charm. These productivity served. Vanished in battle, they left me refreshed. To be thankful, reliant, now on the hour I will court. Fortitude rising with
heard. So an extending horizon in sight I envision will wander, breathing the air of the sky, gift of the breadth and the height. Sudden, a bird unexpected I heard, and the cry made me ponder, strengthened with vigor to race, braced by the depth of the night. Tonight I have a particularly agreeable theme, and that is comic strips. I'm interested in the way they function. I've been reading the comic strips before ever looking at the headlines or the opinion page or the local news um, throughout my uh, adult life so far as I did during my childhood. And I'm thinking that uh, this is really um, a, a, a remarkable kind of a thing uh, because uh, the characters, it just suddenly struck me one day, are remarkably inertial. That is, they're inactive. Uh, they don't do much. They're lazy. Why do I spend so much time on these people? And then I began to realize, or at least to, to theorize, maybe this has some relationship to the uh, um, topic I, I dealt with in, in my last episode, which was um, mental fights uh, over dereliction of duty, whether in a fanciful or, or outdated setting, but uh, basically designed to let things, uh, problems in your mind act themselves out so that uh, after the feng shui was completed successfully, you'd wake up refreshed in the morning. Now it occurred to me that uh, perhaps the uh, uh, comic strip reading was a kind of therapy of a similar kind. Uh, what it does is it takes the hypertrophied ego, the bloated and overactive conscience, and it says, forget it, relax, take a break, have a laugh. I think that's the moral. Uh, of my ruminations, and that's the topic of my poem. Dagwood and Beetle and Garfield and Wally and Earl and Chip Flagston. What are the comic strip guys trying to say, do you feel? Witness our favorite characters daily conveying a message. Humorous hero to be idle and lazy remain. Readers whose steady employment must follow with rigid requirements. Is it a holiday time we are invited to share? Often deprived of their sleep are the bulk of today's population. Maybe we're getting advice. Now, just relax, have a laugh. Somewhere I'm thinking I heard long ago that American workers shoulder a heavier load daily than people abroad. I, when a child, was preoccupied chiefly with doing my homework. Even the sweet violin learning took arduous hours. Civilization is never contented. A fact, and we learned it simply from being alive or from perusing our Freud. Seems that comedians rather would urge, take a rest, you have earned it. Zany and lazy will aid humor and snoozing enjoyed for tonight's concluding episode in the seventh cycle i have decided uh, to write a short commentary on a little two-liner by friedrich schiller one of germany's greatest poets and uh, the one who wrote the same ode to joy that Beethoven was, was later to set to music in his Ninth Symphony. Here's what Schiller writes in his poem is called Root of All Evil. Being at one, that is godlike and good. Why the mania making people suppose this the one only and only one thing? Yes, being at one with yourself, being at one, that's just fine. But why should there just be one way of doing a thing? Why should you get fixated on habit? Why not more open to novelty? Well, I've decided to apply that saying of Schiller to my own writing of the Ovidian Distics, which I've been doing throughout this book. I am now going to uh, tr turn uh, the, the distical form upside down or reverse it. Instead of one and a two and a three and a four and a five and a six and one and a two and a three, four and a five and a six. How about this? One and a two and a three, four and a five and a six. One and a two and a three, and a four and a five and a six end. 
you'll decide whether you like how it works. But I've enjoyed it, and here's my poem where I try to carry it out. Start again with Schiller. Root of all evil, being at one, that is godlike and good. Why the mania making people suppose there's the one only, and only one thing? Here is a guide for my life as a person, a poet, a writer, being at one with yourself, loving the other as well. Who's an imaginer? One who finds novelty space, a delighter. Trying first this and now that, multiple stories we tell. Multiple forms we adore, couplets both olden and new. Tidal, my liking for each, finding bliss while I float on the breakers. Orpheus, Morpheus, I, dreaming, arising to view, alternate feelings awaiting, and all of them poetry makers. Let me attempt to embody, combining the one and the other, version of distical form, change as a poet ideal. Comrades in beauty pursuit, may the lyrical sister and brother find in the sort I've designed means that may comfort and heal. Poets who look for a god find an imagining soul. Day, life, and night are the dreamings the ocean of seam has provided. Me have the tones of the sea played the determining role. Drop and a wave and a current and wind breath. I'm tidally guided. 